Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege to introduce to you Emeritus Professor of Physics, Emeritus Dean of Engineering, Emeritus Provost of Cornell University, and Emeritus President of Cornell University, Dale Corson, who will introduce Carl. Professor Terzian, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Carl Sagan for his lecture, The Age of Exploration. Dr. Sagan first crossed my consciousness one day in 1967 when Professor Thomas Gold, chairman of our astronomy department at the time, came to my office. I was University Provost at the time to tell me about Carl Sagan promising young astronomer at Harvard, whom Tom said he thought we could get. He told me that Sagan was a brilliant planetary scientist, and furthermore, he had a great ability to tell the lay public in understandable terms what astronomy and science are all about. This latter particularly caught my attention. It represented a unique ability, and we needed more of it in the university. I responded that this seemed like a good opportunity, and why didn't he make an offer? Professor Gold said he had no money, <laughs> and that I would have to provide the funds. Now, this is a game that every entrepreneurial department chairman tries to play. But I didn't dismiss gold as quickly as I might have some people. I'd known Tom for a long time. I'd been chairman of the search committee that brought him to Cornell, also from Harvard. Harvard's good recruiting ground. <laughs> Tom's always been an exciting person to have around, with more ideas per second than anyone else. And I've always enjoyed talking with him. He has ideas about everything, the expanding universe, how to ride a unicycle, uh, pulsars, Carl Sagan. But there's a problem. Sometimes his ideas are wrong. <laughs> On the theory of riding the unicycle, for example, I think he never learned. But usually, he's right. He was right about pulsars from the first moment. He told me that if I put up the money to hire Carl Sagan, I would never regret it. I did put up the money, the offer was made, and Carl came to Cornell, and I have never regretted it. Tom was right. You already know all the great things Carl has done the past quarter century, although you may not appreciate all the solid science he has done. You can take my word for that. I've always been grateful to Carl for his willingness to talk to alumni groups and to other lay groups. When I was president, I asked him to do this billions of times <laughs> when I could find him. And he always said yes. He did hesitate once when it was a black tie affair in Chicago, but when I explained the importance of the occasion, he accepted. I think he rather liked the black tie part of it, and I'm not sure he ever returned the rented tuxedo. Maybe that's why he's never been able to go back to Chicago. <laughs> Carl has received more honors and awards than I could possibly relate. Let me limit this reference to reading the citation for one of his recent honors, the Public Welfare Medal of the National Academy of Sciences, the Academy's most prestigious award. For his ability to communicate the wonder and importance of science, to capture the imagination of so many, and to explain difficult concepts of science in understandable terms. That says it all. Carl Sagan on the Age of Exploration.
Thank you, Dale. I, uh, I never knew that Tommy hit you up for my salary. I'm grateful to you both. Uh, it's true that uh, Tommy Gold recruited me for Cornell. I uh, remember the inducement, a uh, very small and exceptionally good astronomy department, superb ancillary departments in physics, chemistry, and biology, a beautiful campus, um, laboratory facilities, um, which were, by some standards, very generous. Uh, but still, I hesitated. And I remember Tommy made the final inducement, uh, I think knowing full well what he was doing. <clears throat> he took me <clears throat> on a little trip to Upper Enfield. And uh, I thought, my goodness, here is a national park as exquisite, well, it's not really a national park, here is something as exquisite as any national park I've ever been in, and it would be right on my doorstep, and uh, that is the missing ingredient, and Tommy was extremely persuasive on every level of inducement, and I thank him very much for the invitation. Um, I've lived now in Ithaca longer than I have lived in any other place in my life, and uh, I'm extremely grateful to Cornell and the town of Ithaca. I consider this my, my true roots. I didn't know what it was I was going to talk to you about tonight, and so I tried to, uh, to pick a topic which was sufficiently broad and ambiguous that whatever I thought I would talk about would fit. However, what I've decided to talk about doesn't fit. Well, maybe it does. We humans have had civilization only for about 10,000 years. Our species is a few hundred thousand years old. Our genus, the genus Homo, is a few million years old. And therefore, for the vast bulk of our tenure on Earth, we were something other than sedentary. And the word has such an aura of self-congratulation, civilized. What were we? We were hunters and foragers. We wandered in small, itinerant, extended families. And our knowledge of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle is due to a few courageous and far-seeing anthropologists who went and lived with the few remaining hunter-gatherer groups before they were finally and utterly destroyed by civilization. The anthropologist from whom I learned the most about hunter-gatherers is uh, actually here with us, Richard Lee of the University of Toronto. He studied a people, the Kung San, of the Kalahari Desert in uh, the Republic of Botswana. And uh, I want to just give a little flavor about my understanding of our ancestors from Richard Lee's study of the Kung San. I want you to know I practiced before the mirror for about half an hour. <clears throat> the first thing that I think is very important is that they are highly technological. The technology is uh, wood and stone and domestication of fire technology, 
but it's absolutely technology, and there are experts and other people who are not quite as good at the technology. Um, but not only are they technological for fun, they are technological because their lives depend upon it. Um, chipping and flaking stone tools back before they, they uh, had a little trickle of metal into their economy is very difficult to do. And of course, they, they did it superbly well. And the archaeological and anthropological record is clear that we were technologists all the way back to the beginning. So the idea that uh, science and technology is something new, something uh, unusual, something we can even find books that say not really very human is completely backwards. Technology is, if anything, the most characteristically human activity, although, as I'll mention later, it is not exclusively a human activity. Now, one very interesting insight, I thought, is uh, hunter-gatherer tracking techniques. Um, a uh, small group with their uh, bows and poisoned arrows and digging tools and a few other uh, lightweight technological contrivances is following the game. They come near a stand of trees. They take one close look at the ground. Immediately, they know how many animals went by, what their ages and sexes were, how long ago they passed. This one is lame in the back left foot. At the pace they're going, we should be able to overtake them in another two hours if we hurry. Now, how do they know all that? In fact, what do they notice in order to follow the game on which their lives pretty well depend? One thing is a hoof print. Different animals have different characteristic shapes of their hooves. Different size animals leave different size hoof prints. But the decay of the hoof crater, the falling of pebbles in, the collapse of the raised rims, debris blown into it, tells you age. And in fact, it reminds me of nothing so much as determining ages of planetary surfaces by looking at how fresh the impact craters are. Uh, I think the reason that uh, studying cratering physics seems so natural to us is because we've been doing it for a million years. They also know that, uh, that herd animals in the hot sun like to avoid the sun. If there is a shadow on the ground, they will deviate from their path to just run through the shadow a little bit. Well, where the shadow is depends on where the sun is. And therefore, when you see the deviation, you know that there had to be a shadow at that spot when they passed. Well, where in the sky did the sun have to be in order to cast that shadow? Oh, it was 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, now, I don't claim that uh, every contemporary, well, there are none, but back 10, 20 years ago, every contemporary Kung San um, made a scientific calculation, did the trigonometry of the, the uh, angle of the sun. That's not what it's about. This was tradition. They, uh, each generation taught the next, but someone had to have figured it out. And that someone had to be a scientist. And uh, this is another reminder that uh, we've been scientists and technologists from the beginning. Now, having said that, I want to turn to the important and uh, rueful fact that every human culture has considered itself at the center of the universe. What's this about? Well, I think it's very straightforward. Back then, in hunter and forager times, many 
modes of modern nocturnal entertainment were unavailable. Some were available, but many were not. <laughs> Television was not available. So over the dying embers of the campfire, people watched the stars. And they did it, I imagine, for many reasons. One, it is just dazzling. And uh, we today, living in polluted, under polluted skies and in cities with light pollution, have mainly forgotten how gorgeous the night sky can be. It is not only an aesthetic experience, but it elicits unbidden feelings of reverence and awe. Secondly, people made up stories about the stars. They invented uh, Rorschach tests up there, follow the dots, constellations, look like a bear to you, Og. Yes, I guess it does. And, uh, <laughs> and then forced their children to memorize these absolutely arbitrary patterns. <laughs> I don't see the bear's tail, Dad, shut up. And um, then myths were invented either before or after. Uh, so these were visual reminders of stories. Uh, the bear ate your grandpa, something like that, was put up in heaven as an example. Um, or there was the story first, and then people put the, the bears up there. But beyond that, there was something enormously practical. That is, the stars and their rising and setting are a great clock and calendar in the sky. And in the absence of artificial timepieces, that's extremely important. Because there are certain seasons of the year when the herds are running. There are certain seasons of the year when the trees are ripe with nuts or fruit. And if you know what those seasons are, and you know what the moment is, you can prepare. And you can also eat. Now, the most superficial examination of the sky shows the stars are rising in the east. Some of them pass directly overhead, and some of them pass on small circles close to the horizon. But they all rise in the east. They all set in the west. And then, in the daytime, they do something else. They somehow go around the bottom of the earth that none of us has ever seen. Uh, it's flat as a board, of course. And then the next morning, they come up again in the east. Now, there's, there's absolutely no doubt from this fact that the stars, the planets, the sun, and the moon all go around us, and we're obviously not moving, that we are at the center of the universe. It's an observed fact. Anybody who denies that is, there's something wrong with them. This is the geocentric conceit. Now, not only did every culture draw this conclusion, but I think it's clear that our ancestors took enormous personal satisfaction in it. Because think about it. We are at the center of the universe. The center of the universe is surely an important place. Not only that, what? Other animals, what plants, make use of the apparent motion of the stars? Only us. Therefore, the stars have been put there for our benefit. And the sun and the moon are practical uh, objects. Maybe, there was some confusion. Maybe you know the, uh, the old story about the, the Persian wise man and philosopher who was asked which is more useful, the sun or the moon, and replied, uh, of course, uh, the moon, because the sun shines in the daytime when it's light out anyway. <laughs> Whereas the moon only shines at night when we need a little light. But uh, even when people got things, you know, a little wrong, the centrality of our position was stunning. And uh, I, I imagine an extraterrestrial visitation 
of the sort that there is absolutely no evidence for, uh, coming upon the Earth, of course, running around the sun once every year, and then listening in on, on what people all over the planet are saying. And they're saying, we're at the center, we're important, we're special, everything goes around us. And then I imagine the extraterrestrials uh, thinking of us as, I don't know, the, the planet of the idiots. <laughs> but that's too harsh, because there's a resonance here between the most obvious interpretation of absolutely straightforward observational facts that every person can verify for him or herself, a resonance between that and our emotional hopes and needs. The idea that the universe is made for us, not because of any particular merit of ours, but just because we're here, or just because we're human. To me, this seems to resonate with the same psychic wellsprings responsible for the view that our nation is special and the center of the universe, which, by the way, is the literal meaning of the Middle Kingdom um, for centuries applied by the Chinese to China. Uh, and even those who haven't made it that explicit, nationalists of all stripes. You can see it, by the way, in the maps, how often each nation has itself at the center of the map. And uh, other nations look at it as extremely peculiar to uh, to see uh, Peru at the center of the map. Uh, what's it doing there? It's, it's weird. And the same psychic wellsprings that say that our gender or our ethnic group or our particular melanin content in the skin or a particular language or headdress or clothing styles or convention of pulling out the handkerchief when we sneeze or anything is important and central and all those alternative ways of being human are somehow less central, less important, uh, less worthy than we are. We have a weakness and scientists are uh, creatures of the culture in which they swim, in which they have grown up, and so we also are vulnerable to this siren song, which we can call chauvinism or geocentrism or anthropocentrism. So you know the story about what happened next, except for a little blip associated with the name of Aristarchus of Samos. We went on, every human culture, every great philosopher, every scientist, every religious leader, thinking we were at the center of the universe. We put it in various guises in our scriptures, declared the scriptures uh, to be infallible, thereby making it not just a uh, secular, but a religious crime to even think about the issue until in the late 15th century, a uh, astronomer, cleric from Poland named Nicholas Copernicus thought he had an alternative idea, namely that the sun was at the center and the earth, like the other planets, went around it. He knew that this was dangerous stuff. And so he withheld the publication of his book until he was on his deathbed. And even then, the way it worked out, when the book was published, it had a preface by a well-meaning friend of his, Alexander Osiander, which essentially said, Dear reader, when you look at this book, it may appear that the author is saying that the Earth is not at the center of the universe. He doesn't really believe that. <laughs> you see, this book is for mathematicians. If you're not a mathematician, close the book. I'm paraphrasing slightly. Um, <laughs> mathematicians find 
that if you wish to know where Jupiter will be two years from next Wednesday, you can get a good answer by assuming that the sun is at the center. This is a mere mathematical fiction, and it does not challenge our holy faith, and uh, please have no emotional angst in reading this book. And this peculiar split-brain compromise actually lasted for uh, almost two centuries in which uh, people actually said, well, it's all right, it's only from mathematicians. Uh, the Bible says the earth is at the center, we all believe that. And then, as you know, Galileo made a forthright and uh, brilliant defense of Copernicus, based in part on uh, a set of observations from the newly invented astronomical telescope, and uh, the church got increasingly annoyed. Galileo remained obdurate. I once had the pleasure at the behest of Franco Pacini, director of the Archetri Observatory, who is also with us here today to uh, actually trod in Galileo's footsteps um, and uh, hold a close replica of his telescope. In any case, when Galileo became too insistent, the princes of the church um, showed him the instruments of torture in the dungeons. Um, they weren't making any particular point, just thought he'd like to see them. <laughs> and shortly thereafter, Galileo made his famous uh, confession in which he abjured the abominable doctrine that the sun and not the earth was at the center. But the stage had been set, the debate went on, and uh, when in the 18th century Bradley discovered the aberration of light, and then in the 19th century the long-sought annual parallax was found, the, uh, the opposition collapsed. And now everybody is taught that the Earth is not at the center of the universe. Except, I think there's a lot of evidence that we are all geocentrists with a heliocentric veneer that's been painted on us. Uh, think, for example, about, uh, about our language, sunrise. I was up before sunrise. Uh, sunset, it was a gorgeous sunset. But the sun isn't rising or setting. The earth is turning. Think of how difficult it is for us to simply parse a simple word or phrase uh, which conforms to the Copernican perspective. Billy, be sure to be home, be home before the rotation of the earth makes the local horizon occult the sun. Billy's gone before you're halfway through. <laughs> Why isn't there any snappy phrase like sunrise or sunset in the Copernican context. Recent opinion polls show that 25% of adult Americans do not know that the Earth goes around the sun and takes a year to do it. In China, the figure is 70%. If you bear in mind that uh, the Copernican perspective got to, gets a lot of press in the United States. I mean, there is NASA. <laughs> there are uh, television programs other than In Search Of or Obscure and Erroneous Mysteries or whatever it's called. <laughs> um, <laughs> we do hear that the sun is at the center. And still a quarter of us have missed it. And in China, you can see where there isn't a NASA and uh, where the television programs are 
much less sophisticated, um, a much larger percentage of people have missed it. If anything like China is typical, it may be that today, five centuries after Copernicus, most people on this planet still think in their heart of hearts that the Earth is at the center. So I think congratulations on our insights in deducing or important, there's something fantastic and great about human beings. There is then actual observation of the circumstances nobody ever thought to look before. And then the result is the daunting and disquieting discovery. No, we're not at the center. No, we're not important. And uh, to my mind, many of the key findings of science, much of the modern scientific perspective, evolves from debates with that character. So let me uh, just try to outline a few, a few examples. Um, shortly after Copernicus, there were people who said, okay, okay, maybe we're not at the center of the universe, maybe the sun is. But we're close to the sun. Look, we're almost at the sun. So we're almost at the center of the universe, it's almost as good. Well, was the sun at the center of the universe, which we can loosely translate as at the center of the Milky Way galaxy? Well, the answer is no. We are not at the center where it looks important, or at least well lit. Instead, we are in, or at least near, an obscure spiral arm 30,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way galaxy in the galactic boondocks. If you were an intergalactic traveler coming into the Milky Way, would, what would you think of someone who said, excuse me, Captain, uh, that's the center of the Milky Way, it's true, but count out spiral arms with me. See, there's one, there's another one really big and beautiful, there's another one. Then over there, you see that somewhat obscure spiral arm? Well, don't look exactly in it, but just a little out of it. See over there? I know it's hard to see. Take a closer look, right, right there. No, no, not that one. That one, see? Yeah, yeah. The guys who live on that one say they're at the center of the universe, and the entire universe is made for their benefit. What would you think of those guys? And then suppose you had the information, there's not one soul on that planet who thinks otherwise. Every one of them thinks they're at the center of the universe. Then there was a, uh, a moment when it was thought, well, at least the Milky Way is, we're in the only galaxy. But no, that's not the case. Not only are there other galaxies, there may be as many as a hundred billion of them. Then there was a moment when the Hubble flow was discovered when it was found that the galaxies are all running away from us, the more distant galaxies running away the faster, as if we had committed some dreadful cosmic social blunder. <laughs> when there were people who breathed a sigh of relief, this was, this was in the 20s of this century. Look, we're at the center. Our galaxy, at least, we're not at the center of our galaxy, okay, but our galaxy is at the center of the entire universe. And this is based upon a serious misapprehension. Um, there is no center to the universe, at least in ordinary three-dimensional space. And astronomers on any one of these galaxies would see all galaxies, would see all the others running away from them in the same way that we do. Then, there was, for a long time, all through my growing up in uh, undergraduate and graduate school career, the, uh, 
the statement, there are no other planets. There was always, that is, in no other solar system. There, there was always a nearby star that was suspected to have planets, and it never did. Barnard's star was, for a long time, a leading hope. And if there are no other planets, if life has to arise on planets, then there's no other life, and there's no other intelligence. And so in that sense, we're at the center of the universe. Well, one of the, one of the things about the age we live in, last 15 years, is that this chauvinism is in the process of teetering and collapsing. Because we find that more than half of the nearby young sun-like stars have circumstellar disks of gas and dust extremely like what has been deduced for the uh, birthing grounds of the planets in our solar system, the key datum being that the uh, orbital planes of the planets are very largely coplanar. And this was, by the way, uh, something that Isaac Newton, no less, uh, thought he could deduce the hand of God from. That is, God took each planet and threw it in the initial condition, uh, all in the same plane. But Kant and Laplace independently knew better, and uh, they used nothing more than Newtonian physics, Newton had just missed it, uh, that the conservation of angular momentum meant that an irregular spinning, contracting cloud would collapse into a disk, and the planetary formation would occur in the disk, and therefore you had to have, collisions aside, uh, coplanarity of the orbits of the planets. Not only are there amazingly numerous such circumstellar disks, but we now have the first bona fide extrasolar planetary system going around a, uh, a star that uh, must be at the bottom of the list of potential candidates that anyone would have imagined, a pulsar named B. 1257 plus 12. A, uh, this particular pulsar is something like the size of the Cornell campus. It's something like an atomic nucleus the size of the Cornell campus spinning at 10,000 RPM, 10,000 revolutions per minute. It's a supernova remnant. There was a colossal catastrophe that blew off most of the mass of that star. And going around it are at least three planets, two roughly Earth-like mass, one roughly lunar mass, a little in closer than, uh, than uh, Mercury, Venus, and the Earth. And whether these planets survived the supernova explosion or formed recently out of the supernova debris, whichever it is, the, the processes which lead to planets look to be very a very broad and general application. And the technology is now improving so that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, in other words, in the lifetime of uh, most of the students in this audience, we ought to have completed comprehensive surveys of the nearest few hundred stars, maybe much more than that, to see what planetary systems they have. So this chauvinism, I think we can also chalk off. Now, there's been the view that if we're not, there's nothing special about us in space, maybe there's something special about us in time. We've been put here by the Creator to take care of things. Stewardship is the very engaging word that is often used. Uh, who knows what would happen to the environment without us? So we, uh, we have an obligation. 
to make sure everything goes as God would have wished it. The only trouble with this idea, well, there are several, but for me, the principal trouble with this idea is that 99.998% of the lifetime of the universe from its beginning to now was over before any human appeared on the scene. So if we are the caretakers, where have we been for most of the time we're supposed to be doing our job? We have been terribly lax. I could see that the, the chief gardener might be very annoyed with us, which in turn might explain a great deal. <laughs> we could not have been put here as caretakers because we have not been taking care. A, because we weren't here, and B, because when we have been here, we haven't been doing very well either. Then there was the view that if there is nothing special about our position in space or our position in time, there's something special about our motion. We have a privileged frame of reference. This was the classical absolute motion physics that uh, every great physicist bought into until 1905. Albert Einstein, a keen critic of privilege in the social sphere, immediately mistrusted the contention that uh, the planet we happened to live on was affixed to an imaginary frame of reference which had uh, special merit with regard to the laws of nature and instead asked what kind of physics would it be if you deduced the same laws of physics no matter what planet you lived on what star you lived on it. And that is one approach to special relativity, which is uh, repeatedly confirmed and is the way the universe is put together. Another chauvinism biting the dust. Now, this is a set of what Annie Drian has called the great demotions. And, um, there are people who find it very upsetting, who still long to be at the center. And one area where you can see the emotions not hidden but uh, written out in clear is in special creation. The notion that we are the particular objects of the devotion of the creator of the universe, that we're different from the other animals, never mind plants, uh, not just in degree, but in kind. And uh, you know the list. No one else has altruism, compassion. No other animal loves their young. Nobody else can foresee the future consequences of present actions. Nobody else has art or music. Nobody else can use tools. Nobody else can make tools. And this list, it goes on and on, is essentially agreed to by Plato, Aristotle, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, Hobbes, Locke, all the great figures in philosophy, with the single exception of David Hume, hats off to him, bought into by all scientists, including highly skeptical ones up until the year 1859, bought into, of course, by all the religious leaders of uh, at least the Western religions, especially the Judeo-Christian Islamic religion. And in 1859, Charles Darwin made the first and heroic effort at pricking this balloon, showing that one species could in fact evolve by absolutely natural processes without anything foreordained from another species. And then when he got up the courage, it took a great deal of it, um, more than a decade later, 
He published his second book on the subject, suggesting not only does it apply to lots of species, but us too. We and the chimps have a common ancestor. They're our cousins. This contention really makes a lot of people upset. Have you been to a zoo lately? Have you looked at what a chimpanzee does? Maybe you're related to chimps, buddy, but I'm not. <laughs> well, we can learn about chimp behavior in zoos about as well as we can learn about uh, human behavior in jails. Uh, and for exactly the same reason. They don't bring out the best in us. But when people like Jane Goodall devote themselves to observing chimpanzees in their natural habitats, the chimps get used to them. The chimps have no trouble recognizing after a while that the humans are somewhat inept chimps. <laughs> then we find very different behavior. And, uh, I can't resist telling the story of Geza Teleki, a uh, anthropologist and animal behaviorist who wished to learn chimpanzee technology, particularly the termite fishing industry in which they are adept. And so he apprenticed himself for nine months to a chimp named Leaky, who was uh, expert. Now the chimpanzee termite fishing industry goes as follows. You find a reed, not any kind of reed, the right kind of reed. You strip it of supernumerary branches uh, feel that it's right, and then go to the enormous termite mound. Now each night, the termites cover over the entrances to their nests. Um, the chimp takes one look, scratches away two, three places where the, the uh, entryways have been walled up, takes the, the reed or grass stem in one deft motion, puts it down into the termite mound, gives a few twists, carefully pulls it out. The thing is covered with termites. The chimp goes num, 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 num. And here is a good source of protein. Um, now, if a human were dropped down in this same place and had a need of protein, this source is unavailable to humans. Teleki, spending full time on this problem for months, could A, not break off the right kind of reed, he in fact had to use the leftovers that chimps had picked out, <laughs> could not after nine months find the openings to the apertures that, that the chimp takes one look at and opens up could not put it down deftly, would do that and the thing would come out accordioned, could not wiggle it enticingly to get the termites on, and could not withdraw it without scraping off almost all the termites. At the end of nine months, he'd come up with one termite per... <laughs> Chimps know how to do stuff. And how do young chimps know to do what Geza Teleki does, did not learn how to do, they were apprenticed for years. Uh, by the way, in Teleki's wonderful paper, in the acknowledgments, he thanks his patient tutor and apologizes for his failures because they are not the fault of the being he was apprenticed to. It's just humans aren't very good at this stuff. There is, in fact, a uh, bonobo, a kind of chimp, who lives in Atlanta, who not only uh, knows how to use stone tools, but knows how to make stone tools. This source of human
pride is again misplaced. Now, of course, there are differences between chimps and us, and we have you know, electric light bulbs and police cars and CD players and nuclear weapons, and all sorts of things that chimps don't have. Uh, but we can't say that they don't have any technology. And when it became possible in the late 19th century to do DNA-based sequencing, you could get a quantitative measure of the relationship between humans and chimps. And it turns out that the two species share 99.6% of their active genes. So one way to look at that is 0.4% is a much larger number than we had guessed. <laughs> and another way to look at that is, you want to know about us? Take a look at chimps. There's a lot there to learn. In any case, the idea of special creation is, uh, is really uh, an idea for another time. If nothing else but the molecular biological evidence were available, it would be very clear that there is nothing in us that is qualitative, different from our nearest chimpanzee relatives. That then takes us to the present stands where uh, where these great chauvinism battles are taking place. One is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We have not found life, much less intelligence, anywhere else yet. We send spacecraft to other planets to look for life. We construct large radio telescopes and listen if anyone is sending us a message lately. Both of these activities have uh, led to uh, occasional tantalizing data but none of it uh, of a sufficient quality to say that we've detected life or intelligence elsewhere. In our ignorance, the geocentrists find hope. They confuse absence of evidence with evidence of absence. You haven't found life elsewhere? There isn't any. We're the only living creatures on the planet. On, in the universe, on this planet. You haven't found intelligence elsewhere? There isn't any elsewhere. It's only here. We are at the center of the intellectual cosmos. And while I could give you what I consider to be a strong plausibility argument why this conceit is also erroneous, it's only fair to say that nobody knows the answer to this issue. We have not found life or intelligence elsewhere. We are in the course of looking. Maybe we will find it tomorrow. Maybe it will take centuries. Maybe we will never find it. And all we have to do is keep an open mind. There's no other approach. You don't have to make up your mind in the absence of evidence. And then finally, there is a new and, uh, to my mind, bizarre field for this debate, something called the anthropic principle which uh, it would be much better called the anthropocentric principle, which uh, comes in strong, weak, and various shades of middling uh, flavors. Uh, the weak anthropic principle says, if the laws of nature and the fundamental constants of nature were significantly different, then the paths which led to us would have been different and we wouldn't be here. That is unexceptionable. Certainly true. Um, no problem. But then there is a strong anthropic principle, which uh, to my mind is uh, dangerously close to the following argument. We would not be here if the laws of nature and the values of the physical constants were other than they are. Therefore, the laws of nature and the physical constants are as they are in order for the universe to produce us. God had us in mind at the time the universe was made, and here we are back at the center of the universe again. There are many things which can be said about this, um, including 
the, uh, the point that Philip Morrison, among others, has made, that uh, who has traced through what other laws of nature and physical constants will lead to the functional equivalence of life and intelligence, it's impossible to do. You can also argue against it that it is not very vulnerable to experimental investigation. But I would just like to point out that there's something telling about calling it the anthropic principle. Because the same laws of nature and the same physical constants are required to make a rock as to make a person. Why is it not called the lithic principle? So there's a strong and weak lithic principle. And in the strong lithic principle, the laws of nature and the physical constants are as they are, so rocks could come into being. Not nearly as satisfying, right? <laughs> but if rocks could philosophize, I bet you we would hear nothing of the anthropic principle, and at the cutting edge of rock philosophy would be the lithic principle. I have only two slides. If I can show the first one, please. This is a absolutely typical astronomical photograph of what's called a star field. Now, focus is important, please. Oh, one right through it. That's pretty good. Oh, back a little. Yup, yeah, good. Now. Take a look up here. What you are looking at is some, I'm not sure, 10,000 stars, something like that. One in front of another so that they seem so closely packed that from a greater distance or with a smaller aperture telescope, you could not even tell they are individual stars. This is what the Milky Way is. It's stars in line of sight so closely packed that it looks like a continuum of light. Many of these stars are more or less like the sun. As I was saying before, it now looks as if planets are a frequent, if not invariable, accompaniment of star formation. And again, I ask you to consider the contention that the only life and intelligence in the universe is, let's say, that dot. No, not that one. That one right there, see? That's it. Nowhere else. Maybe hard to extrapolate from one example, and one example is all we have, but this is so resonant with the other human conceits I tried to outline in the great demotions that I am suspicious of it for that reason alone. Lights, please. I want to conclude with one of the many psychic rewards that uh, planetary exploration has brought, has brought to me. As Ed Stone outlined in his talk this morning, there was a moment when the two Voyager spacecraft had completed their close-up reconnaissances of the Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune systems. No other planets that we were going to rendezvous with further out in the solar system. It was now possible to turn the cameras close to the sun, and if the worst happened and we burnt out the optics, so what? There was nothing else we were going to photograph. Because I had wanted, from the time of the Saturn encounter, to take a picture of the Earth from that remote vantage point. And at the same time, I want us to get to Uranus and Neptune and see, see what was there. And the, the spacecraft phenomenally outperformed its design specifications. And, uh, our, the bulk of our knowledge of uh, the outer solar system has come because JPL did such a brilliant job with these extraordinary spacecraft coming in 
on time, under cost, and vastly exceeding the fondest hopes of their designers. Anyway, as Ed well knows, it was by no means easy, even though the downside was almost nil, to turn the cameras back. And uh, it required an actual intervention by the NASA administrator to get it done. Um, but it was done. Now, it was clear that because the picture, Voyager 1 picture, was taken from beyond the orbit of Neptune, that the Earth would appear only as a single picture element, a single pixel. You would not even see continents. You could not tell any detail. I still thought it would be useful to do in the same sense that the great frame-filling Apollo 17 picture of the whole Earth has become a kind of uh, icon of our age because it said something very powerful to us, including the fact that from that perspective, national boundaries were not in evidence. Well, these pictures were taken in part due to the excellent estimates of exposure times by Carolyn Porco. And uh, I'd like to show you in the last slide, due to motion, the Earth momentarily, no chauvinistic implications, this is just foreground optics, the Earth in a sunbeam. <laughs> Wait a little bit and it's not in the sunbeam. So there it is. I mean, take a look. It's a pale blue dot. That's us. That's home. That's where we are. On it, everybody you love, everybody you know, everybody you've ever heard of, lived out their days there. The aggregate of all our joy and suffering, thousands of confident ideologies, religions, economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother and father, every inventor and explorer, every revered teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every uncorrupt politician too, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there. The Earth is a very small stage in a great cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors, presidents and prime ministers, party leaders, so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of the corner of a dot. <laughs> Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one part of the dot on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of another part of the dot. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe seem to me challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, 
in all this vastness, there is no hint that there's anyone who will come and save us from ourselves. That will happen only if we do it. It's been said that astronomy is a uh, humbling experience and uh, I would add character building. To me, this is one of many demonstrations through astronomy of the folly of human conceits. To me, this picture underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for a great speech. I'm already looking forward to your 70th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Sagan will answer questions for a while. Uh, if there are microphones in the aisles, if you could come to the microphone, it will make it much easier. He'll field the questions himself. Thank you, Dale. I'd be glad to answer questions on anything we've been we, anything I've been talking about, uh, or anything else that's on your mind. I don't promise to be able to <laughs> answer anything, everything, but uh, I'd be glad to uh, give it a shot. Professor James Henderson is not asking a question, <laughs> but merely taking a picture. Yes, please. Yes, please. We'd like to know two things. First one is, who said billions and billions? That I can answer very quickly. It's someone named Johnny Carson. <laughs> I, n I never said it. No, I sorry. never, ever said He's it. He's off the hook, everybody. Um, I mean, it's sort of like um, Humphrey Bogart never said, play it again, Sam. Nobody believes it. But it's he elementary, didn't. my dear Watson. Say again? It's elementary. It's elementary, my dear Watson, is another, in, in, in the movies. He says it. Basil Rathbone says it. But uh, in the Arthur Conan Doyle books, he never says it. Yes, and your second. Okay, so we also want to know, what, if any one thing in particular, would you have yourself be remembered by? You know, I, I hate the, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the one only kind of question, you know. What's your favorite scientist? Or what's the greatest discovery in the history of the world? Uh, um, I don't know. I, I have to leave the decision about how I'm going to be remembered, which I hope will uh, not have to be faced for some time, um, <laughs> to, uh, to others. But thanks very much for the, for the question. Yes? Um, I was interested in your great demotions, and I certainly um, Speak more into the mic. I certainly, let's say, agree in, certain, in some, most ways with what you say. Where among the great demotions would you fit in or would you fit in at all uh, the appearance of consciousness among humans? Yes, that's, that's an important question. I'll repeat it because her voice, while lovely, is very soft. Um, <laughs> Uh, the question is, what about the evolution of consciousness? Isn't this another of the uh, uh, conceits that only humans are conscious? I, I'm paraphrasing. Um, 
but uh, would I include that in the in the demotions? Uh, Annie Drian and I wrote wrote a book uh, called Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, in which we tried systematically to look at each of these uh, what I've called conceits, and I think the most startling thing we learned, or I'll speak for myself, that I learned in the course of doing that book was how we kept getting it wrong on these issues. Now, consciousness has various meanings. If it means an awareness of the external world and modifying your behavior to uh, take account of the external world, then I think microbes are conscious. If you mean deep thoughts, like uh, Bishop Barclay's contention that nothing exists except what's in his mind, I'm with the microbes myself. <laughs> um, you see, how do you know that I think any thoughts? Only because I happen to be communicating to you. You can't easily tell that I have philosophical thoughts by looking at me drinking this cup of water, right? So imagine that I was mute, that I could not communicate by speech or writing or anything else. Then how would you know if I had such thoughts? The evidence for uh, not just the so-called higher apes, but running through the apes and the monkeys, to me, is very persuasive that they have thoughts. Not only deep philosophical thoughts, but useful practical thoughts, like lying, like deceit, like planning to fool others, thinking about it far in advance. But let me just give one, uh, one little image, which I like because it covers many different grounds. These are the results of uh, work at the Arnhem colony in the Netherlands, uh, where there's a large uh, free roaming community of chimps. Um, males are uh, testosterone riven and subject to raging hormonal imbalances. Um, they get angry at each other and uh, pick up rocks. They go quite a distance to get the rocks in order to confront the guy who they don't like and throw stones. The very act of going over there out of sight of the enemy to pick up the stones and then bring them back to throw the stones shows thinking ahead, understanding a goal and aware of yourself and the opposition. But the most interesting thing is it is common for female chimps, seeing the males burdened with their stones, to walk up to them and disarm them pluck the stones out of their arms, open up their fingers, and throw the stones away. And when the males in a huff gather them up, the females disarm them again. So not only do the males know what they have in mind, the females know what they have in mind. <laughs> and that, to me, not only is consciousness, but a uh, social arrangement I'd like to see more of in humans. <laughs> My question is, given all these demotions, what is your personal religion? Or do you, is there any type of God to you? Like, is there a purpose, given that we're just sitting on this speck in the middle of this sea of stars? No, I don't want to duck any questions. <laughs> and I'm not going to duck this one, even though I have... Uh, high religious personages who are close friends of mine in this room. Um, 
But let me ask you, what do you mean when you use the word God? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess what my question, it, it's like, is there a purpose for, I mean, given all these demotions, why don't we just blow ourselves up? It's Why don't like, we? Yeah. What, what, is, what is our purpose? I mean... In, Let me turn the question around. If we do blow ourselves up, does that disprove the existence of God? No. I guess not. <laughs> I mean, it'll be a little late yeah. to make the discovery, but still. Yeah. I, I guess what, I, what I'm asking is since as we, as we kind of make God almost go away in this as as he through these demotions and I, I i don't mean he because who knows what god is but um but still saying it makes it right. sort of icky doesn't it yeah yeah it's it's, it's tough we um, like it to be a he yeah. don't we yeah we've been trained to think of it as a he um it's it seems that through the ages we have humans have created a mythological framework that has always involved some kind of, often involves some kind of higher spiritual powers. And yes. as... Every human culture has done that. As that goes away, as we know more and more that, and it seems harder and harder to prove that anything might exist like that, where does that leave us? On our own. <laughs> <coughs> which to my mind is much more responsible than hoping mm -hmm. that someone will, will save us from <laughs> ourselves so we don't have to make our best efforts to do it ourselves. Okay. And if we're wrong, and there is someone who steps in and saves us, okay, that's all right. <laughs> I'm for that, but we, you know, hedged our bets. Mm -hmm. It's Pascal's bargain run backwards. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll say another word. The word God covers an enormous range of different ideas. And you recognize that in the yes. way you phrase the question. <laughs> Running from an outsized, light-skinned male with a long white beard sitting in a throne in the sky and tallying the fall of every sparrow, mm -hmm. for which there is no evidence. To my mind, if anybody has some, I sure would like to see it. Um, <clears throat> to uh, the kind of God that Einstein or Spinoza talked about, which is very close to the sum total of the laws of the universe. Now, it would be crazy to deny that there are laws in the universe, and if that's what you want to call God, then of course God exists. Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of other nuances. There is, for example, the deist God that many of the founding fathers of this country believed in, although it is a secret whose name may not be spoken in some circles, a, uh, a roi feignant, a do-nothing king, the god who creates the universe and then retires, mm -hmm. and to whom <clears throat> praying to is sort of pointless. He's not here. He went somewhere else. He had other things to do. Now, that's also a god. So when you say, do you believe in God? If I say I, yes or if I say no, you have learned absolutely nothing. I guess I'm asking you to define yours if you have one. But why would we use a word so ambiguous that means so many different things? It gives you freedom to what? define it. It you gives choose. you freedom to <clears throat> seem to agree with someone else with whom you do not agree. It covers over differences. It makes for social lubrication but it is not an aid to truth, in my view. And therefore, I think we need much sharper language when we ask these questions. Sorry to take so long in answering this, but this is an no. important issue. Hi. Hi. Uh, me and some of the other students here at Cornell were uh, wondering about um, your, your house. Um, <laughs> what, was it, was it some kind of power plant or what? Power plant. What, what was it before oh, okay. it was your house? Right, right, right. Good. I, I guess what I said, I try to answer questions even that aren't related to, to what I talked about. I really, I really let myself in for it. Okay. 
that is a study that Annie and I work in and we're, we love. It was, a long time ago, the headquarters of the Cornell Sphinx Head Society, in which God knows what abominable rites were performed. <laughs> but I can assure you, these days, it is extremely <laughs> placid. And uh, <laughs> Annie says she's not so sure. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's very benign, whatever its early history, which goes back to, uh, I think, 1892, uh, may have been. It also was once a uh, sculpture studio of a uh, remarkable Cornell professor, designer of nuclear accelerators, and sculptor par excellence named Bob Wilson. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to know what your views were on astrology. I know it's a related science to astronomy. On what? On astrology, um, exercise. Astrology perception. is a hoax. What's, excuse me? It's a hoax. Hoax? H O A X. So. <laughs> What about, okay, what about the documented proof of... Say again? What about documented proof of studies where uh, what ESP, what? clairvoyance, you totally well, disagree? That's different. That's different, right? Right? Okay, well, that's... Astrology is different from ESP okay. and clairvoyance, Sorry right? to confuse the two. Um, about but, no, I'm happy to answer. I okay. just want to be, okay. be clear. Extrasensory perception, telekinesis, right. do they exist? And does everybody, do certain right. individuals have it? And how did it arrive um, if into society? If it exists, it would have arrived by evolution, by natural selection, the same way as everything else. But what do we mean by extrasensory perception? There is a uh, African freshwater fish that establishes uh, static electric fields and then detects its prey by perturbations in the electric field. We can't do that at all. Doesn't correspond to any of our senses. Does this fish have ESP? In a sense, yes, but... <laughs> okay. If it does have ESP, is this mysterious? Is it a challenge to science? Or is it just another way of perceiving the world? It's, it's a different way of perceiving the world. Yeah. But so, I... therefore, if there is ESP, I think the chances are excellent that, uh, that it can be well understood by science, but to the best of my knowledge, there isn't any ESP. Yes. Hi, I'd like, uh, first of all, to say that it must be a true privilege to be able to develop a career in something as stimulating intellectually and spiritually as astronomy. Now, my question to you is, what's your opinion on the use of animals in biomedical research? On, on what? The use, use of, animals, of animals in biomedical animals. research. Animals. Right. I, uh, I have struggled greatly with this issue. Uh, in part because I have a graduate student, Peter Wilson, who holds my feet to the fire on this issue. For example, I have a 20-year-old leather jacket that I used to wear to Cornell um, that uh, I don't wear anymore. Uh, I do wear it around the house, if truth be told. Um, I am very conflicted on this issue. That gratuitous pain should not be inflicted on other animals, or for that matter, plants, I think is clear. And that animals should not be made to suffer for fairly trivial goals. The making of lipstick, for example, I think is clear. To argue, though, that animals should not be used in the pursuit of medicines and medical procedures that might save the lives of humans is not so clear to me. And uh, Charles Darwin had just the same distinction. He was way ahead of his time in, uh, in opposing gratuitous pain but uh, would also not argue that no animal experiments should be done. And I think if I had to, uh, if I had to explain, somehow it was my job to do so, to uh, 
some people whose child was dying because a medical procedure was unavailable, which might very well have been available if animal experimentation had been performed. I don't know how I, I would do that justification. Now, you might say to me that uh, I'm putting humans higher than other animals. And where do I come off doing that, especially at the end of an evening where I've been decrying chauvinism? This, to me, is like the argument that is sometimes, said. Dave Morrison mentioned it in his talk today. Um, why should we take any steps to save ourselves if an asteroid is going to hit the Earth, since asteroids have hit the Earth in the past? And uh, you know, others have gone, so we might be here, so we'll go, so you know, whatever it is, the raccoons will have their chance, or the ants, or the sulfur oxidation state altering submarine worms will inherit the Earth. Um, at this point, I have no difficulty in, uh, since I happen to be, it's an accident of birth, a human being, to justify human beings trying to survive under sometimes trying circumstances. That's my judgment. I'm sure if uh, you know I were a lizard up here, I would be talking about, uh, yes, let's sacrifice the humans so we can get better medicine for the lizards. Uh, after all, I'm a lizard. Um, I'm sorry, I can't help it. I'm a human. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying this as if I know what your point of view is, but, but I'm just trying to clarify how I, uh, how I think about it. Um, I'd first like to say uh, happy birthday, Professor Sagan. I'm sorry I didn't get you a present. Um, <laughs> now, um, there are various structures in the Andes and um, also formations and crops in northern England, which people say are results of extraterrestrial interference right. or appearances. The, and plains, I was just the plains of Nazca, yes, N-A-Z-C-A. Um, I was just wondering about your views of this, whether or not we actually have been landed upon. And yeah. Well. One way to look at this is, I mean, first of all, what is on the, where did all this stuff about the plains of Nazca being somehow mysterious and extraterrestrial come from? It came from a guy named Erich von Daniken, a Swiss hotelier, who uh, wrote a book called Chariots of the Gods, which became a worldwide bestseller, in which he argued as follows. On the plains of Nazca in Peru, there are large drawings. Some of them look like spiders, some look like turkeys, some are straight lines. Fundonican concluded that the straight lines were airfields, and the other stuff was messages that doltish humans were instructed in carving in the desert of Peru by extraterrestrial overseers. Why? What's this about? We don't know how to draw big pictures without extraterrestrials telling us what to do. Some of those straight lines are six inches across. How big are the airplanes that land on those airfields? <laughs> What are we to imagine? An interstellar spacecraft effortlessly crosses hundreds, thousands of light years. The cargo door is open, and out come little propeller-driven airplanes about that size, like, <laughs> like, like my three-and-a-half-year-old son plays with. And they, they, they land in Peru and tell people, we, we got toy airplanes. Please make airports for us. And by the way, make a big turkey. <laughs> this is silly. The, the common feature in all of Von Donneken's fantasizing is that he sells our ancestors short. He goes to Egypt. He sees pyramids. Boy, those are big. How big are the constituent blocks? 100 tons. 100 tons, says Von Donneken. I couldn't lift a block that weighed half that. Therefore, <laughs> human beings are unable to lift blocks of that mass. Therefore, extraterrestrials did it QED. But if he had read Herodotus, never mind archaeology, this Herodotus is written, you know, it's in English translation, it's in German translation. We have an idea about uh, quarries and uh, logs as rollers and rafts up the Nile and uh, how humans could do it. We're perfectly capable of building things big, even those of us who lived a long time ago, 
even those of us with dark skin, people know how to build big. And uh, the, the, the idea of uh, extraterrestrial visitation is required every time a naive observer can't figure out how something could be done is silly. Um, the one possible positive aspect of von Däniken is that it might, in frustration, drive an occasional reader into archaeology. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, happy birthday. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, a friend of mine, well, now an acquaintance of mine, uh, sold me the idea that Steven Spielberg was going to be here, so that's why I came. But look, I'm, I'm really sorry. happy. <laughs> wait, 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 I'm not done, I'm not done. <laughs> I'm not done. The first I heard of it, I, I, I'm awfully sorry that you disappointed. I, I know, but, I, but I'm glad I came because when you were doing all that thing about pointing out where Earth is and how you know, little we are and compared to the universe, wouldn't it be easier for man, for man, for man, women, the music humans, manager now? Humans, humans. Humans, yeah, I'm sorry, right. okay. For humans to think that we're not the center of the universe if we have all this now data, it would be, I mean, it's, it's easier. Now, what, 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 why can't we believe like, the hard, the challenge now is to think that we are in some way and some and somehow the center of the universe in some kind of way, not not physically, not intellectually, but somehow the. I, I don't want to make it like a purpose, but some. Yes, you do. Okay, it's a purpose, but no, but you know, it, it's now easier for us to believe. Okay, it's easier we can put our mind at rest, but somehow aren't we aren't we closing our mind? Aren't we closing our minds? By not saying that we're not in some way the center of the universe. But imagine that you're an octopus. Um, okay. The, the, okay, wait, 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 wait. I got it. I got it. Wait, wait. What about organisms are not are the center of the universe? Okay, I'll change it. Not, I mean, humans, because we can communicate and understand each other. I'm just saying it because, you know, me, man, you know, we're, we're, but what I'm saying, but your organisms. My mind, my mind is open. You come up with evidence we're at the center of the universe, I will gladly confess defeat. Not now, but. <laughs> Hello. First of all, I'd like to say I'm uh, glad I didn't get to ask my first question about God, and I left it to him. Uh, but my second question, uh, which might be oversimplified, is if every matter has an antimatter, and the Big Bang theory created the universe, which is supposedly the matter, where is the antimatter? in the Big Bang Theory? Um, there is quite sophisticated cosmological speculation and uh, theory on this. Um, clearly, if there's an, an excess of one over the other, and the universe is well mixed, then since matter and antimatter annihilate each other, whichever had a Um, my good friend, the emeritus everything, <laughs> has, the, the emeritus dismisser, the emer dismisser uh, <laughs> suggests that it's time to come to an end. Let me take Dale, if I may, uh, one or two more questions, and then, and then I'll stop. Do you think that we're now as demoted as we can get, or no. do you think that, that can, then can you see... <laughs> What further humiliations can you see for us in the near future? <laughs> Dr. Wing asked, what further demotions, humiliations do I foresee for us? Um, you see, the idea that our sense of self-worth comes not from anything that we've done, not from anything worthy, but by an accident of birth, is where the crux of the humiliation is, in my opinion. I would say those of us worried about being demoted, those of us who wish for us to be important, should do something important. We should make a, an easily understandable, achievable, and inspiring goal for the human species, and then set out and do it. 
that would give us the confidence that we sorely lack by being dependent on our self-esteem being based on nothing we do. We want to have self-esteem? Let's make a planet in which nobody is starving. Let's make a planet in which men and women have equal access to power. Let us make a planet in which no ethnic group has it over another ethnic group. Let's have a planet in which science and engineering is used for the benefit of everybody on the planet. And my personal idiosyncrasy, let's have a world in which we go to other worlds. I think I'll stop there. Thank you.